This is an extract from the Leader podcast by The Evening Standard. The whole thing is available on all major podcast providers. London loves live music. The city thrives on it. From the buskers on the streets, that's a guy called Andrew Duncan in Chinatown last year, to the orchestras at the Albert Hall. But in between all that are the clubs and halls where the hard graft is done. These are where the acts hone their sound, learn how to perform, get discovered, and they're in serious trouble. The Music Venue Trust has drawn up a list of 30 sites across the country that face closure because of the coronavirus lockdowns. Seven are in London. The Trust has started the hashtag Save Our Venues campaign, and with me now is its CEO, Mark David. Mark, when you're talking about a crisis, just how bad is it for these places? Yeah, I mean, basically what we've done is to effectively traffic light these venues and to kind of look at, okay, what condition were they specifically in at the time that, you know, we looked at them and how long were they secure for? And we looked at these seven that we got on this list and, you know, the, 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 the debts that they've got, the rent they need to pay, the, the services they've got to pay for, there isn't any way we can see that we can do that without public support and without support from their local authorities. And these are pretty well-known venues. You've got places like Alchemy in, in uh, Croydon, uh, the Windmill in Brixton, it's pretty legendary, the Lib Windmill, there's loads of people who have played there. They, I mean, these are not clubs and, and, and venues that people haven't heard of. No, absolutely. You know, these these seven and, and they it's what's important to understand is that each of these plays a very important role in its own little local community or within the broader music community. You know that a lot of these have a particular genre of music they're known for. Or, you know, you look at somewhere like the Post Bar in Tottenham, that's got a very specific audience, local community around it. Um, the waiting room, you know, that's another type of music. They're all part of the ecosystem. And it's really important to understand that when you, you lose a place like this, it isn't just that you're losing that place, you're losing the artists that, that use it, the community that's built around it. You're, the, the businesses around it quite often rely on people that are going to that venue for the business they all also generate. But what can people do to help these venues? Because it's not like they can, it's not like you're saying, right, everybody go out to a venue because of course they're all closed. They can't do that. They can't put money behind the door. They can't put money behind the bar. How? Does London help these venues? Well, each of these venues has now got a crowdfunding campaign. And it's not just, can you just donate some money? There's also merch on sale for each of these pages, which we as a central charity have created. We've paid for the production of it. People can buy a T-shirt, buy a hat, buy a face mask. Everybody needs a face mask at the moment. But it's also just about being very vocal about them. Each of these places has a community. The whole of London benefits from the existence of these places. And actually what people can do is they can write to the local council. They can write to the local MP. They can say, this really matters to where I live. This matters to London. What are you doing about it? But we need actual action on these seven specific venues now. And that's going to happen because local communities and the music community in London get behind them. Make a small donation if you can. Buy a merch item if you need a new shirt. But write to your local council, write to your local MP and say, what more can be done? And the Evening Standard spoken to the seven London clubs at most risk. You can read what they have to say in the newspaper or online at standard.co.uk. Now. I'm not scared of silent devotion. I came. That's Ida Wilde's Dream Variation single from last year. This year, in fact, this month, they were due to perform in Brixton as part of their 25th anniversary tour. Not surprisingly, that hasn't happened. So the group is on downtime, and so is everyone that works with them. Guitarist Rod Jones is with me now. Rod, you're an Edinburgh band, but London has played a really important role in your history, hasn't it? Just as it has with so many other groups. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've played every sort of size of venue in London to some extent over the years, from the powerhouse in Islington to Water Rats to, you know, up to the Roundhouse. They're all special and in and different ways. And we, we've always been lucky in a sense that like London audiences always get a bit of a reputation as chin strokers, don't they? Of, of not being particularly like full on like a Glasgow crowd, for example. And 
We've it's actually always not been the case for us at all. We've always had a great audience in London. I think the last time we played the Roundhouse, we had to stop for a minute because we were a bit overcome by the crowd singing. You know, it was it was quite in, uh, incredible. You know, I remember dingy punk rock gigs at the Hoop and Anchor and and Steve Lamack and and our manager Bruce coming to see us at the Hoop and Anchor and sort of you know writing a piece about us in Music Week the next week. And that's really kind of what broke us as a band, I suppose, or what got signed essentially. So, it, yeah, it's really. It, it, you don't realise how much you miss something, do you, until it's not there and you almost take it for granted. And then when it's taken away, you think, oh, right, I really am. I need to do that again. I really actually almost need to do that, you know. And London and Glasgow, too, are cities that are internationally renowned for live music, aren't they? If we lose these venues, we lose a major reason for people to look at London, at Glasgow, at Manchester. Yeah, I think they're such an integral part of why those cities are vibrant and, and people want to be there, you know, and I think, you know, we're, I mean, we're based in Edinburgh, but and Edinburgh's always had a slightly sort of lack of a, a cohesive music scene, and that's because of the venues. You know, Glasgow's always had, like, incredible venues and a wealth of them you know i think edinburgh has struggled with that over the years i suppose maybe it's been more of a literary literary city than than glasgow to some extent you know you can always sort of tie it to a, how the art school is in each city can't you a little bit how good the music scene is so people want to be there because music culture i think is the heartbeat of a city to some extent and and yeah if you lose those venues you you lose that heartbeat and and yeah it, it, it takes away something special and the other thing is that when you look up on a stage when you're at a gig you see the band that's what you're there for you're having a great time what you're maybe not seeing or completely understanding you're seeing is someone tune the guitars someone set up the speakers somebody's mixing that sound right now somebody's doing the lighting somebody else is doing a hundred other jobs behind the scenes and all of those people are freelance and they're all out of work right now and it's a serious problem. It's a huge problem. And, and, you know, I think there are lots of people in all walks of life that have kind of fallen through the cracks, as they say now. Um, and none more so, I think, than live crew. It sort of hit home to me that actually, like all these people who are my friends who have worked with us for many, many years are, are struggling. It, it felt like we needed to do something. And I looked at our crew and realised that half of them, if not all of them, are as talented, if not more so, than the bands they work for in terms of musicianship, you know. Um, I thought, well, could we make a record with them? What about if we get the crew to cover a song of the band they work for, and then maybe we get the singer from the band to sing on it, and then we sell that to A, raise awareness, and B, to create a hardship fund for crew. And so a good friend of mine, came it wasn't me unfortunately came up with the incredible pun of whole lot of roadies and it was literally in the space of a week I'd, I'd sort of I'd been sitting on the couch had the I had the idea phoned a couple of friends immediately all of them you know that could do it or were able to do it were like yeah of course we're going to do that but I mean when you're saying you're talking to some friends on the phone these are some pretty impressive friends you've got there <laughs> I mean, some of them, uh, you know, I, 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 they're not all in my phone book. I had to f call in a few favours, but, you know, we've, I've done work with a bunch of them before or we've played with a bunch of them before or, we, or we've been in the scene together for many, many years. You know, people, even bands like Mogwai or people like Catherine Joseph, the excerpts who told us this years and years ago, and I'm good friends with Faye from the Rosillos and, and, you know, I've done some work with the Proclaimers before. So it was fairly easy. You know, it was a case of just call them up and go, come on, let's do this. And everybody was like, yep, let's do it. And it's been great. The response has been absolutely phenomenal and we've had all the socially distanced and, and responsibly had all the roadies into the studio and they've all come in and recorded their parts and been like incredibly well prepared and you know some of the some of the guys in some bands are in trouble that's all i'm saying and that's the leader podcast keep up to date over the weekend with standard.co.uk we're back on monday <laughs>